Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's study. As we proceed to consider some points that tie back in with all that we have been looking at with the need for us to be prepared to give a message sent from God, there will be some different points that we will look at today. As we open the word of the Lord, shall we ask him for his guidance and for his direction so that we may more clearly understand that which he would have us to know at this time? Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you have provided us with another day where we may understand more clearly the words of Scripture. Help us now, Father, guide us in all that you would have us to understand. We pray, Father, for traveling mercies for Theodore as he goes to his dentist. We pray that everything may be taken care of without pain. We ask that you show us that which you would have us to understand today, so that that which we consider may be according to your will. Direct us now. Be with us in this study. Show us, Father how we may continue to serve you. For this we ask, for this we pray, and this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, this is going to be a bit different from what we have been dealing with in the book of Daniel because there's a lot of points that are yet to be brought out in those studies, especially in Daniel 12. So we're going to change things just a little bit today. We're going to look at some things out of the New Testament And we're going to consider these items so that we may add to the need that we have to understand the changes that we're going to to be seeing within our own characters. Now, we're going to start first with portions out of Acts verse, verse 6. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And there arose certain of the synagogues which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and came upon him, and caught him, and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face, as it had been the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Now we look at this, and we are dealing with what led up to the stoning of Stephen. How does this link in with what we have been looking at and considering from Daniel verse 12? Are there points here that we can see? The first thing that I would look at, Stephen's character was such that the Holy Spirit was with him. Because how else are you going to have the face of an angel? Many of these men would never have been able to recognize an angel in their lives. Yet, they very easily could have recognized the light that would show from an angel. Because an angel would be that that would be of service to God. Now, as we skip further into the book of Acts, Acts 7, 5, 2, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they slain, have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. 
and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, was being inspired to understand exactly what was being shown here. He was being shown that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit and was being shown exactly what he was seeing. How could this be if Stephen, or excuse me, if Luke was not being divinely instructed? Now, what's going to follow with this are very simple. These are portions of admonitions from Mrs. White. Brethren in responsible positions, you are in danger. I lift my voice in warning. Beware. Unless you watch and keep your garments unspotted from the world, Satan will stand as your captain. It is now no time to hide your colors, no time to turn traitor when the battle presses sore. It is no time to lay down or hide our weapons and give Satan the advantage in the warfare. Watchmen on the walls of Zion must be wide awake. Call to your fellow watchmen in no sleepy terms. The morning cometh and also the night. If no response is made, then know that the watchman is unfaithful. It is now no time to relax our efforts, to become tame and spiritless. No time to hide our light under a bushel, to speak smooth things and to prophesy deceit. No, no. There is no place for sleepy watchmen on the walls of Zion. Every power is to be employed wholly and entirely for God. Maintain your allegiance bearing testimony for God and for the truth. Be not turned aside by any suggestion that the world may make. We can make no compromise. There is a living issue before us, which will be of vital importance to the remnant people of God to the very close of this earth's history, for eternal interests are here involved. What is she saying to us here? What are we finding as we hear these words and as we consider what Mrs. White has been saying. She's speaking about entire consecration to God. I would agree. Now, this last Sabbath, I went to a church. I was being told how the speaker that was going to be there was so very powerful. Yet, everything the speaker had to say was providing nothing more than the milk of the word. Was there anything of prophecy? Was there any warning? No, everything was being presented was of Jesus loves you. You love Jesus. Everything is amazing. This is not a time for any watchman on the wall to do anything except to warn people and to show the need we have to present a message that is like the messages that were presented from 1840, 41, 42, 43, and 44. We are to look constantly to the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. All that Jesus did on this earth was done with an eye single to the glory of his Father. He says, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. The commandment I have received from my Father. John 14, 31. John 10, 18. In all he did, he was working out the will of his father so that his life on earth was a manifestation of the divine perfection. The union of divinity with humanity in Christ was to reveal to us God's purpose to bring men into the closest connection with himself. We cannot possibly be happy without him. Light increased light from heaven is waiting to be imparted to those who will walk and work in the light which they already have. There is to be quick and earnest thought, talent, and tact displayed in enterprises that will communicate light to those who are near and afar off. Careful consideration should be made of every way that is not the way of the Lord. No sleepy watchman must be tolerated. Under their leader, The principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world are at work. Who is leading the sleepy watchman? What does Sister White say? She's talking about Satan. He's a prince of the power of the air, and he pours upon him the spirit of deep sleep. 
So how can they be even called watchmen? Well, how many times do we hear about this fantastic pastor or this amazing evangelist? And how often do we find when we listen that they want to tell us that everything is all right? We don't need to worry about the prophetic messages. We don't have to be scared. We just need to accept Christ. All we need to do is to accept Christ, love God, and we will be saved. Nothing about examining your soul. Nothing about examining your character. It's all up to them. Nothing is about us. Isn't that the way that a lot approach things today? Oh, man, it's peace and safety. It's like a lullaby. Exactly. Because it has been so difficult to arouse from their lethargy the many who have long professed to know the truth, spiritual wickedness in high places has increased. Men have taken their stand to hedge up the way of the Lord's army of workers. They have taken souls unawares and led them into strange paths. May the Lord show these men who have long been hindrances, who, whenever opportunities have presented themselves, have placed a stumbling block in the way of others, on whose side they have been worked, and the need to make diligent work of repentance. They have been weakened, they have weakened the hands of others, and have given the enemy every advantage. This is a very telling comment, and this is not one that many within the church really want to have heard. Now, this next document, written on the 25th day of the second month of 1899, according to the Julian calendar, has no symbolic meaning for us whatsoever, right? There will be many that won't catch this type of comment. When we lose sight of what the Lord has done in the past for his people, we lose sight of his present workings in their behalf. Are we to have our view of the past coloring our view of the present? Are we to have learned from that which has gone before us in order to recognize what is now occurring in our time? Those who enter the work now know comparatively nothing of the self-denial and self-sacrifice of those upon whom the Lord laid the burden of the work at its commencement. This should be told them again and again. Those who engage in the work now will need to carry it forward in the same humble spirit with the same self-sacrificing principles that have characterized the true worker in the past. A stern conflict is in progress between the Prince of Life and the Prince of Darkness, and this battle calls for constant vigilance on the part of devoted workers. There must be no indolence, no sleepy watchmen on the walls of Zion. The workers in the cause of the Lord must allow God to choose his own instruments for the work he has to do. If men refuse to accept the ways of the Lord, if they resist for any cause the light sent from them by heaven, they will be found among the workers of iniquity. Those who, after serving on the side of Christ, take this position, exert an influence as much more dangerous than the one who has never professed Christ as his light and the office of trust have been greater. Now, this small underlined portion in this paragraph, I felt was very telling. So consider this for just a moment. So, Dwight? Yes, ma'am. I'm reading those last two sentences, and I, I find them quite quite disturbing because I'm thinking about Jeff now, who seems to have been recanting everything that we formerly believe, or some of us formerly believe. Right. It says those who, after serving on the side of Christ, take this position, like they're resisting the cause of light sent them by heaven. Exert an influence as much more dangerous than the one who has never professed Christ as his light and office of trust having greater. You know, it's really, really disturbing to me, and I'm sure it's disturbing to you and others who are trying to remain faithful to what God has already shown us 
And now a lot of people are believing everything that Jeff is saying, and they're not examining what they have learned. They're not testing it by the word of God. They're not looking to God for guidance. It's like it's a form of idolatry by believing that Jeff is infallible. I mean, they may as well be following the Pope. And that's sad, isn't it? Well, this should really make a sigh and cry for the abominations, you know, because it's really it's it's almost giving me ulcers. Well, when we're when we look at that sentence, when we look at the sentence that came before us, especially if they resist for any cause, the light sent them by heaven, they will be found among the workers of iniquity. One of the questions that I had asked in the in this last Sabbath study was the message regarding the destruction of Nashville given to Sister White was this sent of God. Yes, it was. Was the message of the destruction of Nineveh sent through Jonah provided by God? It was. Was this not light that was sent by heaven? Yes, it was. So if if this is to be resisted, if this message is not to be given, then are we standing on God's side or are we standing under the black banner of the great apostate? I would say the latter. And that is, for me, a fearful thought. Yeah. You, you mentioned them that, the last, the last sentence. Yes. I, I think it, that could also apply to us individually because you know, it's times that I think I should, I thought that, you know, if God put, had put me in a certain position and I, and I was pulled away from it, that would, that would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Um, and thank you, William. We need that reminder. Yeah, that would be, that would be the same thing. If I, see, if I took, if I put it in my own, I, I look at it as he hurt God talking to me and telling me that if I, choose to walk away from his message that this is going to happen. And right. that, that's what's so fearful about is that if I walk away, then I no longer have that sweet love of Jesus Christ, right? Correct. Now, all of this is part of a theme because right now we have many that are choosing to depart from all that has been studied in the past. They are choosing to say that many of the points in examining the scriptures after July 18th is not necessary. All we need to do is turn back the clock and begin going back to a time where numbers and prophecies and so many other things were not as prevalent. Mrs. White continues, those who have laid stumbling blocks before the inexperienced who have clouded the minds of those who have not had a personal knowledge of the Lord's dealings with his people in the past, who have opened the door of temptation through which doubts and questions have come in and have left the impression upon the minds that the testimonies of the Spirit of God are not reliable, can only help to undo their work by making their confession in full, decided and broad as their influence has been, by reaching those upon whom they have brought confusion and uncertainty by resistance to the Spirit of God. Now, here again, this manuscript, Manuscript 23, written on the 25th day of the second month, we have a symbol of the seven times. We have a symbol of what we are not to do as a watchman on the wall. We have a symbol that is to give us at this time a message to examine our characters to see if we have been made white, tried, and purified. At the present time, God's spirit is being grieved. Satan has been encouraged in his special work for this time. Those who have erred in the past and have not humbled themselves to fully confess their wrongs and make them right will continue to move in their own spirit. They will call truth error 
and error truth. These men will eventually be found on Satan's side of the controversy. The Lord has declared to me that thus it will be. Our God is a jealous God. He will not be trifled with. Now, if they are calling truth error and error truth, we are being told to avoid this. We are being told to examine for ourselves the truths that we find in Scripture. How else can we do that but by private study and study with other brothers and sisters? Can we examine these things when we are more intent on casting people out from the movement, from the church, from whatever? God is faithful in his promise, so also will he be faithful in his threatenings. Brethren, I may be silent in the grave before these warnings from God may have the desired effect upon your minds and hearts. But the words of Paul, I say to you, knowing the terrors of the Lord, we persuade men everywhere to repent. Second Corinthians 5.11. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Joshua 24.15. Is there any time that is more important than this? for us to come into a personal knowledge of what has been said for our admonition in Scripture. Things must be now, things must now be called by their right name. Backsliding leaders are not to be honored as men who are holding their confidence firm. God is in earnest with us. We are to sound the note of warning. Is this in line with what we have just been reading yes it is is this telling us what we are to do if this is to be called by its right name if somebody is preaching peace and safety are we to accept the message that they are giving us no we're not are we to hold up those that are backsliding as men that are honorable and in the right frame before god where the bible tells us not to go with a multitude to do evil. Exactly. Now, this next portion, this next paragraph, the way it's presented is extremely blunt. Wake up. For Christ's sake, wake up. May God give success to those who are trying to arouse the sleepy watchman. Of many of those who profess to be the shepherds of the flock, God says, they are unfaithful. They have left their first love. Unless they repent, I will come suddenly and will remove their candlestick out of his place. Here we are to see Revelation 2, 4 and 5. What warning for what church is this? Is this not the warning for Ephesus? And what? Yes, it is. I just looked it up. Okay, please continue. I said I just looked, looked it up to make sure. Yeah, it's to Ephesus. And of the seven churches, which one was Ephesus? That was the first church, right? Right. Now, there are those that would say that the message that we have today is to be for the church of Ephesus. That we are now, that we are now to not consider Laodicea, the final church that we are to again return to Ephesus. But yet here, Mrs. White is saying they have lost their first love and is repeating the warnings given to Ephesus. Well, notice it says, unless they repent, I will come suddenly and remove the candlestick out of this place. So somebody had commented a day or so ago that Jeff's death is probably going to occur soon. You know, that's what I'm thinking about, the candlestick being removed, because they're looking to him for guidance instead of to God. What happens to the sheep when their shepherd is lost? Well, they that all go true. astray. I was going to ask, you said, you said Ephesus, you, when, right now they claiming to be Philadelphia, right? Right, they're looking to turn themselves back to Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, that's... You had my, I had, I was kind of, I'm sorry, you was kind of, it kind of confused me there for a minute. You went back to Ephesus. 
instead of Philadelphia. That's the reason I was asking. Okay, so the, the reason behind something like this, William, how many times in the Bible do we find the children of God returning at God's instruction to something that they've done in the past? Don't we always find them going forward? That's right. Now, here we have a situation. There are many of those right now that in listening to some of the other things that are presented, that would believe that they are not Laodicean, that they are to become, again, Philadelphian. You know, I asked that question last Sabbath. I not it was not 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 last Sabbath, but the last Sabbath before. Okay. I asked. I said, "Where is where is how is Philadelphia the eighth church?" And and I said that I only see five church, six, uh, seven churches. Right. And I don't see no eighth church. All I see is seven. And I asked them that. I said, "What? How is it? Where's that eighth church coming in at?" Maybe I'm taking it too literally or I'm not taking it spiritually, but I'm trying, been trying to figure out how did they get from seven to eight? They claim they use, they claim they use that, that riddle in 17. Right. But, but I don't think you could skip the churches like that, can you? I don't think you can either. And that's what my confusion was. I couldn't, I couldn't understand how they get you know, but anyway, that's just, I'm, I apologize for. Oh, I apologize. Falsehood doesn't sanctify, sorry, falsehood does not sanctify. So how in the world can Laodicean people who prove by their fruits that they're Laodicean claim to be Philadelphians? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, what, not, I, that's the same thing I'm thinking. I don't understand how they can go from Philadelphia to to lay at the sea and then Philadelphia again, unless Jesus was coming in there and he could chase us all, you know, to the heavenly kingdom. But I don't, <laughs> I don't see it nowhere. So maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think you're wrong. We need to carefully consider many of these points because we need to know on what our faith is based. Go to work now without delay. How many judgment calls must the Lord make before his people cease to provoke him to his face? How should he deal with them according to their backsliding, according to their worldliness, and to the way in which they have called darkness light and light darkness? They would have no further calls to repentance, no more evidence or light to trifle with. What happens to those that choose that they do not wish to have to ever repent. What happens to those that refuse light? They are lost. Is that where we want to find ourselves? Well, I think you got a quote where Miss White says, if they, they, they choose not to go further into light, the light that they had would turn into darkness. I think. I think you're, I think you're correct. God's people provoke him by their idolatry and their union with worldlings. He says, my spirit shall not always strive with men. I will not always bear with the perversity of those who lead souls from the narrow way into the paths of uncertainty and falsehood. Where do we find the quote where God says, my spirit shall not always strive with men? Genesis 6, I think it's verse 3, just before the flood. So what, in in a very symbolic way, what is Mrs. White saying to us here? Is and she our not, probation is about to close. And the end of the world is at hand, right? Amen. I will not always bear with the perversity of those who lead souls from the narrow way into paths of uncertainty and falsehood. Unless those who have been offered, who, who have been often reproved, make a decided change, they will be left to follow their own way. His blessings will be taken from those who choose darkness rather than light, those who choose false guides rather than true. To those who have, who disregard the evidence given them, making no difference between truth and error, the light bestowed will become darkness, 
and how great will be that darkness. Brother, does this go in line with what your understanding has been? God sent Christ into the world as the great medical missionary. In our work, we are to bear the messages that he bore when in the world. We are to preach the gospel and heal the sick. Medical missionary workers are to stand before the world as God's representatives, witnessing to the importance of the truth for this time. All with whom they come in contact should see that they have a living connection with the great medical missionary who gave his life that through the work of the Holy Spirit, men and women might be convinced of sin and led to repentance. A most trying time is before us. And until the close of Earth's history, the perils thickening around us will continue to increase. And still, notwithstanding the importance of the present hour, Seventh-day Adventists are, as church spoken of in the last part of the third chapter of Revelation. The whole of this chapter is a lesson of warning to us, to which we shall do well to take heed, for the time is at hand. Now, here she is being shown that the entire third chapter is a lesson of warning. What is included in that third chapter of Revelation? What churches? Message to Laod. Right. Philadelphia, and then you got um, Smyrna. I think it is. Is it Smyrna or? I believe it's Sardis. Sardis, okay. Philadelphia and Laodicea. Right. So if the whole, if the entire chapter is a lesson of warning to us, is she saying that these lessons of these churches are a good thing, or is this a direction for the things that we need to consider to see changed in our lives? Well, verse 3 says, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour will come upon thee. This is to Sardis. But it's to everybody. Right. It is. Now, in preparing this document, I skipped a few paragraphs. We're still in manuscript 112 of 1904. There is a great need now of men who understand what it means to live for God in a world where idolatry and all other kinds of iniquity prevail. Men and women have been blindfolded by the theories and the skepticism of Satan because iniquity shall abound. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If it were possible, Satan will deceive the very elect. (laughs) My apology. Have we not seen this with what happened with Parminder and Tess? Amen, and we're seeing it again now. How sad is this? Heavy responsibility rests upon those who stand in positions of trust in the cause of God. The work of proclaiming the third angel's message should be carried forward in the power of the spirit. The present is a time of fearful peril, and those who stand in positions of responsibility are not to keep silent. Of what use are sleepy watchmen who cannot see the threatening danger and who do not warn the people? Here, how are sleepy watchmen to be of good? if they are not seeing what is happening before them. What precious victories we might gain in the name of Jesus if we would be doers of the words of Christ. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. John 13, 35. Oh, how how hard many make the Christian life. They climb the steep, briary path staggering under imposed burdens as though they must tinker up the characters of others. Are we responsible for anyone's character except for our own? I would say no. They make the way to heaven very hard. They do not experience the sweet peace of Christ. They do not grasp the help that Jesus gives them. But they are continually grieving over supposed wrongs of others and overlook the cheering blessed tokens for good all along their pathway. Just as soon as one has a vivid and all-absorbing consciousness of his own personal accountability to God, 
and of his duty to his fellow men, and senses that his influence is far-reaching, stretching into eternity, he will not be satisfied with a low standard. He will not be fault-finding and critical of others. He will make his own life what he should wish the lives of others to be. He will live only in Christ, utterly and wholly dependent upon him for every beauty and loveliness of character. This is the burden of my labor, to get the minds of the people away from envy, jealousy, and evil surmising. I try to impress upon them their duty to answer in their own lives the prayer of Christ, that his disciples may be one, even as he is one with the Father. This blessed oneness, this unity of believers, is the credential we bear to the world that God has sent his Son, that they may be one even as we are one, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, John seventeen twenty two and 21. What joy would it bring to my heart if this sweet unity prevailed? If self would be overcome, all wrath, all bitterness, all malice, all contention and evil speaking be put away from Christ's followers. Self wants supremacy. Self is struggling for the mastery. If the professed followers of Christ would only follow him, if they would only humble themselves under the hand of God, what a work might be accomplished. This was written in 1878. Was Mrs. White seeing the type of unity that we see occurring in the first part of the book of Acts within this time of the history of the church? Far from it. Here she is talking that the minds of the people need to be led away from envy, from jealousy, from evil surmising. She is speaking that this unity of believers was not occurring 10 years before 1888. The law of God is the standard by which character is to be tested. If we erect a standard to suit ourselves and attempt to follow a criterion of our own devising, we shall utterly fail to secure heaven at last. We are altogether too selfish, loving our own way and cherishing our mistakes. Many have received as a birthright traits of character that do no honor to the cause of God. And through wrong education, these have developed into marked defects. Many have become sharp, domineering, critical of others. They choose to put their own mold on the cause of God, thus marring the work, forgetting that the signet of Christ should be placed upon themselves and upon their labors in his cause. <clears throat> Is she telling us we are to be critical of those within this work? Are we to be looking for ways to tell others to leave, that they are not following according to the word of the Lord? No, you know, I'm thinking of John chapter 9 about the blind man, blind from birth. We're all spiritually blind from birth. Christ heals and Then he goes back to give, give a message to the leaders in the synagogue. And they cast him out. But Christ comes along to encourage him. And I think we need to be keeping that in mind right now, too, because they're looking like the Pharisees, uh, which were of him, heard these things and said unto him, are we blind also? Yes, you are blind also. You're more blind than the people that you're blinding. Right. You no, know, it's just. Are we to be doing the work of God according to our own ideas? According to Christ's ideas. Right. Jesus is the perfect pattern. Instead of trying to please self and have our own way, let us seek to reflect his image. He was kind and courteous, compassionate and tender. Are we like him in these respects? Do we seek to make our lives fragrant with good works? What we need is the simplicity of Christ. I fear that in many cases, a hard, unfeeling spirit that is entirely unlike that of the divine pattern has taken possession of the heart. This cast iron principle, which has been cherished by so many and which has even been 
thought of virtue must be removed that we may love one another as Christ has loved us. Here again, this was being presented three years before the 1888 General Conference session. Now, this next document from November 30th of 1886, two years before the General Conference of 1888, was published on the 11th day of the ninth month of the biblical year 5929. So here is the 9-11 for their time. We must expect to meet and bear with great imperfections in those who are young and inexperienced. Christ has bidden us to restore such in the spirit of meekness, and he holds us responsible for pursuing a course that will drive them to discouragement, to despair, and to ruin. Unless they daily cultivate the precious plan of love, many who believe the solemn truths for this time are in danger of becoming narrow, unsympathizing, bigoted, and critical of others, esteeming themselves as righteous when they are far from being approved of God. Some are uncourteous, abrupt, and harsh. They are like chestnut burrs. They prick whenever touched. These do not rightly represent Christ. They do incalculable harm by misrepresenting our loving Savior. We must come up to a higher standard, or we are unworthy of the Christian name. We should cultivate the spirit by which Christ labored to save the erring. These are as dear to him as we are. They are equally capable of being trophies of his grace and heirs of his kingdom, but they are exposed to the snares of a wily foe, exposed to danger and defilement and without the saving grace of Christ to certain ruin. Did we view this matter in the right light? How would our zeal be quickened and our earnest self-sacrificing efforts be multiplied to come close to those who need our help, our prayers, our sympathy, and our love. Brothers and sisters, I look at this. I look at these warnings. I consider carefully the words that Mrs. White provided us. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the book of Acts, did the disciples and those that believed with them come together in order to cast others out. Nowhere did they become critical of the words and the works of others. How did they meet in that upper room that was so esteemed of God that after they had met that the Holy Spirit could be poured out upon them? What went on in this in this situation? They examined in their own hearts and they confess their faults and sins to one another. Okay. I think they did everything that's in um, 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. How so? I'm sorry, brother. Not a problem. How so? How did they do what we find in 1 Corinthians 13? How, what, what is your point? I'm fixing it to you. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Well, I was thinking about the fruits of the Spirit. I might have got the wrong chapter. No, it's the end it. And now abide in faith, hope, charity, and these three, and these three, but the greatest of these is charity. They all exhibited the um, fruits, of, which is faith and hope. And I forget which chapter. I apologize. <laughs> You're fine. No. But, um, Go ahead. They exhibited all the fruits of the Spirit. Correct. Now, at the beginning of the book of Acts, we have Luke writing. As he starts, the former Trieste I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. <laughs> Here we are. There are those of us in the past that have been baptized with water. We have had a, a church and a movement that has been waiting for the baptism of the Spirit. Why has the baptism of the Spirit not occurred? Alpha's in the. Go ahead. I uh, was just summing it all up. I mean, we've got so much rubbish, in front, speaking of myself mainly, so much rubbish in front of our hearts and in our hearts that the Holy Spirit does not have room to, to cleanse and purify and use us the way he wants to. Right. And God help us all. The disciples and those with them came together of one accord after Christ's ascension. Right? Amen. They met in the upper room. They met, they prayed, they confessed sins to one another, they waited. Now, continuing in Acts 1, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the, or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. <clears throat> so the progression was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the world. Are those described in Ezekiel 9? to do it any differently are we not to give our warning first to the ancients before the house of god to the house of god to all of jerusalem and then to all of israel before we go further to the world acts 1 9 and when he'd spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight after these things were spoken Christ ascends into heaven. I would submit for your consideration <clears throat> that after these things are done, as in after a true unity comes forth, a unity that God can bless, then the Spirit will be poured out. Then this work will go forward in great power. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, <clears throat> behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And they returned, they, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Acts 1.14. And they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Now, is there anything symbolic about 120 being gathered together in this upper room. Do we ever find this symbol used anywhere else within Scripture? Yes, you do. You have it in um, Genesis, at the flood, before the flood. Okay. And you have it in other places as well. I can't now, remember. Genesis before the flood was what I was thinking of. So why... Why would we refer right back to Genesis before the flood with the 120? Was this not a symbol? <clears throat> Was it not said in Genesis that the days of man shall be 120 years? Is this not showing from God that within 120 years that probation will close? Amen. 
Now here we have 120 that are gathered together within this upper room. It is from those 120 that 3,000 were baptized in a single day. It is from those 120 that the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now, is the 120 a factor of the 144,000? What do you think? Yes, it is. So how do we come up with this? We would have 120 by 120 by 10, right? Okay. 1,200 by 120 is another way, way of factoring it. Does this say anything to us at this time? Does this symbol mean anything to us for today? Is Palmoni or Palmoni leading us as he has been leading in showing us numbers from scripture that we need to observe and to understand? Yes, it is. Now, we need to recognize we need to come up to this higher standard in order to be worthy of bearing the name of Christ. There are many <clears throat> that show that while they have said that they are accepting the name of Christ, that they are unable to properly represent Christ. Is this not taking the name of Christ in vain? Yes, it is. Is this what we are to do at this time? Every soul is dear to God and to Christ. We are given the opportunity to give a message to see if those that are more intent on being critical and on casting others out, if they will repent. There are not many that come before the house of the ancients. <clears throat> but from them, a message is given that spreads to the entire world. When I'm looking at these studies from the book of Daniel, as we have been considering them, as I'm looking at the studies from the book of Ezekiel, when we are looking at Revelation, when we are looking at Acts, we are given a pattern. If we are unable to see the pattern, if we are unable to come together, to study together, to learn together, then how will we ever give a message together? Any other thoughts or comments or questions? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing and for the guidance that you are providing for us. We ask, Father, that we may more carefully consider these words of the pen of inspiration, that we might more con directly examine our characters so that those things that need to be surrendered to you may be surrendered so that we may become the people that you want us to be. Direct us through this day. Be with us in our endeavors and help us to consider carefully the steps that you would have us to take at this time. For these things we ask, for these things we thank you, for these things we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.